Hard boiled Haggerty in the ring now. Today is the heyday of the pretty boy. Kowalski is called killer for Dr. Gene Stanley of Chicago. She likes it. Oh, boy, that can hurt. Right here at ringside while we go in for a riot of rough house that's widely called wrestling. In the year 1812, the author Lee Hunt wrote, I think the young women of this present day too forward, and the men not respectful. I hope our grandchildren will be a lot better. I wonder what in the world Mr. Hunt would have thought of this. I want to show you just how much I truly think of you, Jasmine. What would her mother say? This match I'm sure you're going to enjoy. Rolling over. Remember this hold. You may want to try it out on your mother-in-law sometime. You'll never beat me. You'll wash my clothes. You'll wash my windows. You'll baby my diapers. You're nothing but a... The pre- and post-game antics on early TV were soon to closely resemble their male counterparts. You want to be an animal? I'm blessing you like animal. That's not a lady at all. It is hard to trace the actual beginning of women wrestlers in North America. But we do know that in 1890, a lady by the name of Minerva was promoted as a champion woman's wrestler. She hailed from Hoboken. Her real name was Josie. Josie was a pioneer, not only in wrestling, but also as a weightlifter, and performed feats of strength. It was not long before the drawing power of women in the ring was recognized and exploited. Wrestling was actually an established sport in North America among the native Indians when the Europeans began to settle in the 15th and 16th century. The English in North America and the French in Canada turned wrestling into a popular sport and by the end of the 19th century, moneyed wrestling matches were in vogue. But for women wrestlers, life was a lot tougher. To start with, there were not too many women wrestlers so like Mae Stein, they found themselves wrestling men. This meant women traveled long distances to face worthy opponents. This fight featured Senorita Alvarez from Argentina up against Madame Roxanne from Switzerland. After World War I, more women entered the fray. Some claimed championship titles, but the majority knew because they were women, the crowds would come, and for a little flavor, they threw in mud wrestling. But during World War II, because of the shortage of men, women wrestlers became immensely popular. And with the advent of television, they became an established part of the American sports picture. Names like Mae Weston, Mildred Burke, June Byers, and the fabulous Moolah became household TV stars. But a young blonde, who was a sight to make old men young, was about to enter the arena. She was to become the first women's AWA champion. Her name, Penny Banner. And this is her story, for Penny Banner is a true icon of wrestling. Miss Banner is giving the champion a lesson in the proper way to reduce. The only trouble with this kind of reducing plan is you may lose an arm or a leg. If this doesn't fit your needs, try a foot massage. I was born Mary Ann Kostecki in St. Louis, Missouri in 1934. I was the first daughter of my father. He's a full-blooded Polish. His name is Kostecki, Kazimir Kostecki. And my mother's name is Clara Bainey. She's full-blooded German. And mom and dad went on to have uh, three more children. I was born right after the Depression. Things weren't really all that well. My father worked at a shoe company and uh, he also sold candy on the side, and mom was a full-time housewife, and, and we had just the best time, and then one day, my daddy was gone, and I was, I was 11, and my sister was nine, and my brother was seven, and my youngest brother, he was one week from being born. And mom and dad, dad found himself another woman, and my mama caught him. And 31 years old with four children, one still in the basket, she threw him right out. And that was it. And from that day on, my sister and brother and mom, we, we did have a bit of a hard time. 
Anyway, we ended up in the orphan home. Mom wanted us all together, so she put us in St. Vincent de Paul orphan, Orphanage in uh, North St. Louis, Missouri. It's fluorescent, I think is what it's called. And we were there for nine months. I made it all the way to two months in third year of high school. I was 15, and so I left high school and I got a job downtown St. Louis in a little hamburger shop. And this fellow, 21 years old, me 15 and a half, he come walking me home and he was so nice to me. And, and as time went on, he was getting, he knew I was by myself and he forced himself up into my house with me and ended up, I found out he was wanted by the FBI. And so we set him up and uh, we met at a movie theater and the FBI said, how will we know him? And I said, well, I'm, I, we'll go to the movie theater and when he goes back to get my popcorn, you can get him. And that's exactly what happened. They were there waiting for him. He looked at me and he says, when I get out of here, he says, I'm gonna find you. And I looked at him and I said, and my eyes were like this and he walked away. So I was so afraid of him. I went and visited him in jail just so he wouldn't know that I helped turn him in, you know. So I'm walking toward this jail little window in there, and he says, I know you turned me in. I know you did it, and when I get out of here, I'm going to find you, and I'm going to kill you. I said, no, you're not, and I turned and I left. So I think I'm hiding. Well, I don't know how he found out. But I'm walking down Lafayette Street, and next thing I know, somebody's at my shoulder, and it's him. He made me lay down in bed with him, you know, and I had to lay in his arms and, and cause he, cause we fought so much, he knew he couldn't overcome me, you know. I don't know why he did that. And I wouldn't tell my dad and I wouldn't tell my mom. I was afraid that he was gonna hurt them, you know, cause he said he would. He, he said, yeah, I'll kill your daddy too. The way fate had it, where I worked was a car dealership, and there were two brothers and a sister. And this sister was married to a man, and they were getting a divorce. So he asked me if I would take care of his three kids. One was two, one was four, and one was six. And I just loved them. Anyway, as the story goes on, I love them. I got, I got $15 a week. He said, when I come home from work, you can have the car. So he gave me the car, and I went off and I worked at a lounge in the evening time. And I, oh, so in the basement of this house is this whole gym set up. So I'm saying, this Blackie's gonna get out of jail. I'm gonna go downstairs and boy, I'm doing 100 pound squats, 100 pound presses, you know? And I was doing, I was gonna really get him. I'm doing all this training. I mean, I was so, powerful and I knew judo and everything and in the daytime the kids would go to school and I could lay out and get some sun and the sprinkler on me I thought I just had life by the you know what and I'm in this lounge working taking this girlfriend's place and in walks a fellow who knows president of the wrestling alliance and he asked the owner he says who's the new girl you got over there and he says, oh you won't believe this girl can do 200 sit-ups he says, you're kidding. I said, no, I'm serious. She can do 200 sit-ups. So when I walked by, he says, you can do 200 sit-ups. I said, yes. He said, I bet you $20 you can't. I said, well, when work's over, I'll do your 200 sit-ups for you. Work ended. I did 200 sit-ups. Well, he trots himself off the next day to Sam Mushnick, the president of the NWA Wrestling Alliance. So Sam Mushnick calls me. He said, well, why don't you come to my office? It's on 14th and Locust. So I went there, and sure enough, there was a picture of Mildred Burke and Dottie Dotson and Mars Bennett and Nell Stewart. And I said, oh, what do they do? And he said, they're girl wrestlers. And I said, hmm, where do they wrestle? And he says, they wrestle everywhere. He said, would you like to be a wrestler? And I said, well, yeah, but, you know, I don't know how to wrestle. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. What would you think about it if we got you a train ticket to go to Columbus, Ohio to the school of Billy Wolf's wrestling, all-girl wrestling, 
we'll give you $50 a week and uh, we'll give you a piece of paper saying if you don't like it, in two weeks you can come back home. I said, okay, and I was 19 years old then. I knew Penny Banner when she was 19 years old and was just starting in the profession. She didn't know who I was and she was absolutely the most desirable female creature that I had ever seen at that time. And, didn't, and then I found out how tough she was, so that, you know, settles you down. And, um, and I've known her since then, and that was in 1956. Did I just tell her age and mine? <laughs> The referee is a gentle soul, and he tells the girls that he doesn't want any rough, ungentlemanly fighting. And, of course, our lady wrestlers are never ungentlemanly. As Mae Weston and Mildred Burke fought it out for the title, it would not be long before two new names would be constant contenders for this valued prize. They were Penny Banner and June Byers. In um, 53, Mildred Burke and Billy Wolf had broke up. And Mildred Burke took some girl, res girl wrestlers with her and moved to California. And Billy Wolf kept some girls to stay in, Char in, in uh, Columbus, Ohio. So Billy needed a champion because his champion just left. Somehow he arranged Mildred Burke and June Byers to have a championship title match. August of 54, which was a month after I began, and June Byers was taking on all comers. And anyway, Billy Wolf says, you're gonna go challenge June Byers. And I said, why? He says, because you're going to get $50 if you do. Both girls seem tired after that go-round. Miss Byers tries to pull a fast one on Penny, but the attempt isn't worth the nickel. The champion has the baffled Miss Banner in a precarious predicament in the corner, but the 160-pound challenger turns the tide of battle in her direction with some bruising but illegal punishment. Proficient Penny tries to better her position, and it proves to be her downfall. Only some stiff neck strategy saves the overconfident challenger. Miss Byers turns on her hapless opponent with an attack which is uncharitable, to say the least. champion gets Miss Banner in an unbreakable bridge hold, and that does the trick as Miss Byers pins the challenger to successfully defend her world title. Penny is peeved by her misfortune in the ring, and she turns on the referee with all her feminine fury. But when the ref loses his temper, Penny makes a quick exit. She's 10 years experience, you know, and she was really good. And I stayed 10 minutes with her, though. I got my $50, and... Billy Wolf come up and gave it to me, and he says, you're now a professional lady wrestler. And that's what I am, or was. That's how it all began. Penny Banner, one of the greatest and, and perhaps the most popular lady wrestler of all time. And she doesn't get the credit she deserves uh, because she was, we talk about mad and chain wrestling. Penny had it all, and never a slow moment with Penny. She was always action, always going, always on. You can tell when somebody has some sort of an athletic background, and uh, and she she just definitely had that. Her balance, her movements, uh, you know, and and the intensity that she would put things at the right place at the right moment at the right time. It was it was very very much so uh, a, a, a hell of an athlete just as, as soon as I met her, you know. And I knew she was gonna then be, quote, one of the better ones, period. Penny was the best girl wrestler that I have 
ever had the privilege of being in the ring with. She, uh, she had knowledge, and, and I learned from her. She used to beat my butt all over the place, and she just, I mean, she was wonderful. There was only a couple girls that I could say that would do what Penny done, and it was long before and far in between the glamour, bringing the beauty out, the voiceness that she gave, the sexiness that she gave, and the skill that she produced in that ring. And boy, she could, I mean, she go out of those ropes, it was unbelievable. I mean, just, she just, she actually was a great wrestler. Penny was a great wrestler. There's no, no doubt about it. And I think if Penny got in a ring now, she could do it. Some of the young women that uh, are in the, the footage of the matches, and Penny Banner was brought as the legend ringside uh, for cheerleader Melissa and Tiffany. Uh, just those women all respect Penny Banner because they know that she is one of the top, 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 if not the you know, greatest women's wrestler, uh, a professional wrestler style of all time. And uh, so much respect ringside, all of the, uh, uh, the lady wrestlers of Cauliflower Alley and the male wrestlers too. The most famous person I ever met was I was in Nashville, Tennessee, and I told this fellow, I said, I'm going to go home for the weekend and visit my mama. And he said, you're going to be in St. Louis this weekend? He said, I said, yeah. He said, I understand you like Elvis, don't you? I said, I love Elvis. I sing everything he ever done. I love him. He's great. And he says, you want a ticket to see him? And I said, oh, you don't know Elvis. He says, yes, I sell his bubbles and things. And I said, you're kidding. He said, no, he said, I'll get you a ticket. Well, I went down there to the Keele Auditorium, picked up my ticket way up in the balcony I'm sitting and I'm saying to myself his name was Bevo Beavis I said yeah Bevo you know Elvis Presley here I am up there they're walking by I bought a dollar binoculars and I'm trying to see everything down there and here come five policemen up to me says are you Penny Banner and I said yeah and they said we are looking all over this place for you come with me and they took me backstage and there was Elvis standing right there and he looked at me and and I looked up at him and we just looked at each other and he smiled and I smiled and, and I stood there and I watched him do his thing and then he come out and he says, I want you to go to the hotel. Will you come to the Chase Hotel afterwards? And I said, okay. He said, well, meet me there. So I met him at the Chase Hotel and uh, golly, we talked and we both jumped in bed and then we kissed and kissed and we kissed and kissed and kissed. Well, we kissed so much we fell asleep. That was 1956. And I, I was just so busy wrestling all over, and he was busy doing his thing, but the first time I wrestled in Memphis, Tennessee, guess what, I had a note, and it said, Elvis wants to see, can he come backstage? And I said, well, yeah, he can come backstage. So he come backstage, one of the girls fainted, and he says, I want you to come to the mansion. And so he took me to the mansion that night, and then every time I wrestled in Memphis, Tennessee, he came and saw me wrestle on. I think my favorite favorite deal to remember is going on a trip from her from with her from St. Joe to Calgary, Alberta. And she had just came back from from Nashville and uh, and from Grayson really because she was dating Elvis at the time. And I must have asked her fifty thousand questions, but just just that trip in general to get to know her and and see what she was really like. It was a you know, that, that friendship has lasted for years and years and years, and, and she, she's my hero. I thought I found the man of my life when I married. I stayed married for 35 years, but um, I just found out that life's not this little red bowl that I had pictured marriage to be, and I held on as long as I could. The best part, I had a daughter, still have my daughter. But I left my husband after 35 years, and he was a, a wrestler also. And it's just, you know, there's so much temptation out there for the men. The girls throw themselves. We call them arena rats. They just hang around all the guys, and, and they have no thoughts. And, of course, 
they don't, the publicity never publicizes the woman, the life, the, their home life. And it's the same for football, all the male stars that are out there, even today. Football, basketball, soccer, hockey, all them. Women flock to these fellows because they're, they're such manly men. And you know, when you're young, I guess you just don't have the, the whatever it takes to not do what you shouldn't do when you're married. Penny has competed in the U.S. National Senior Games and won a third place medal in the swimming backstroke event. I love my life now. I'm in the Senior Olympics now. I found out I have emphysema. I threw my cigarettes away. I swim. I compete. I do the discus, the shot put, the hammer, the javelin, the weight throw. The first highlight of my career was Stu Hart in Calgary, Canada. I had been up there once before and I had won all my matches with a partner that I had when I was 1955, Bonnie Watson was my partner and we went up there and we won all of our matches so then he wanted us back again so we went back again and when we went back again Stu Hart says you know I'm going to make you two girls my Canadian champions and that's the first time that I ever had a belt. I had the championship, Canadian Women's Tag Team Championship. It was Bonnie Watson and myself. June Byers is who I was supposed to wrestle that night for the NWA title, and she didn't show up because I went the time limit with her in, in, in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And she didn't show up a year later when I should have wrestled her then. And, and James Barnett said there was going to be a championship match, there's going to be one, and it's going to be the AWA Ladies Champion. And he took the nine girls and made a battle royal. I won it, became the first ladies AWA champion. And that's the highlight of my career. If I had to be remembered one one particular way, I would want to be remembered as an athletic, good-looking woman, full of life, that likes to have fun. That's what I'd like to be remembered as. And I would also like to be remembered as the only first AWA Ladies Champion. <laughs> it is said that age is the most terrible misfortune for mankind. This cannot be said for Penny Banner. Today in her 70s, Penny Banner is still very active and can look back with pride on her long and distinguished wrestling career. She is the proud mother of a beautiful daughter. She is an author, having written her biography. The book is titled Banner Days. It is truly a tell-all biography. She is a proud member of the revered Cauliflower Alley Club. This is the place where all the great old timers gather once a year in Las Vegas to get together and honor the past. Many young pretenders to the throne of wrestling are in attendance to pay homage and their respects to the greats of the past, without whom there would have been no future. As a matter of fact, because there was no special category for women CAC awardees, they created a special one just for Penny, awarding her the Art Abrams Lifetime Achievement Award. But on the 21st of May 2005 came the crowning moment in Penny's career as the president of the Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame inducted Penny into the Wrestling Hall of Fame. Perhaps these words sum up Penny best. Happy is the woman and happy she alone. She who can call today her own. She who secure within can say, tomorrow do thy worst, for I have lived today. Live long, Penny Banner. refer to your manual.